Three years running, it has meant the SEC Eastern Division. It's a de facto championship game to meet uh, Alabama. Florida, Georgia, it's always a rivalry. It's always meaningful within those two fan bases. But again, three consecutive years, it has meant a whole lot more than that across the college football map. we got David Waters on the line from Gators Breakdown to help us do exactly that, break it down. David, how you doing tonight? Doing good, Mark Rogers. Yeah, you're right, man. Three three years in a row, this is a top ten matchup since Dan Mullen's been hired. So that's the uh, that's the stakes uh, that uh, you know both coaches are really going after. Three three years in a row, top ten matchup, and uh, it's been Georgia on top the last uh, the last two years. Dan Mullen's first two years. Oh, you brought up his name twice, so I got to ask you about Dan <laughs> Mullen. <laughs> so. Man, been in the headlines recently, hasn't he? I thought I watched a lot of Mississippi State football, and I don't remember Dan Mullen causing this much of a stir. Now, I, I do remember he used to kind of poke Ole Miss a little bit and that sort of thing, but maybe it's because he's at Florida and it just draws more attention. That's that's part of it. Yeah, that, that's a lot of it. Um, so, my goodness. Um, so, you, you can go to one of two camps following this issue with Missouri, either that Kyle Trask got belted mm -hmm. and nobody noticed it that mattered uh i don't know necessarily that it was targeting but it was a late hit personal foul mm -hmm. all those things should have been called so his players his offensive line in particular is going to come to his defense and his head coach uh, who i understand was also headed to the officials to also talk about some other um supposedly missed calls in the first half there but you go yeah before you, before you go far there mark that was yep. like right before that hit i mean not long before that hit Mullen was going after the referees, and I think he was saying four or five missed calls. And there he's clear as day on TV saying, that's four, that's five you know, missed calls. So he was already ticked at the referees by, by the time he had got to that point. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then on top of that, his quarterback gets smashed um, way after the whistle. And then, so, so the, the one camp defends Mullen to say, look at all the stuff that's going on. He's going to run out there. He's going to confront the officials. Oh, yeah, by the way, then his quarterback gets hammered. Um, uh, in the other camp, there's the he's inciting a riot. He's inciting a fight. He goes out there. He makes matters worse, pushing people around, yelling and screaming and so forth and so on. So, so where do you fall on this? Mark, two things can be true at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, basically the way you explained it, I, I think both both things happen. Um, I think he had a right to go out there and talk to the officials because the the officiating was terrible in, in, in the first half. A lot of – there weren't even questionable calls. I mean, it was clear. Why are you calling these penalties on Florida? Because it was – I mean, there weren't penalties. You know, offensive pass interference and defensive holding that – I mean, it, it wasn't even close. No, nobody really knows where those calls come from. So like I said, Mullen was already ticked off. His quarterback gets hit late. The offensive line's kind of going at it with the Missouri defensive line. He goes out there, and he, don't get me wrong, he 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 runs out there pretty fast. <laughs> and I'm sure that caught the eye and probably came across the wrong way uh, to the Missouri side. And I, I don't blame them. If I see an opposing coach running as fast as Dan Mullen does as well, I'm like, okay, something something's going on here. Uh, and so, you know, Mullen goes straight to the referees. I don't think there's any question to me of where he was going. He was going straight to the referees. Um, and then right around the same time, I think says a couple words to a couple players, but those players that he were talking to were not even the ones that started a fight and that didn't start a fight right there. That the pile of a fight was 50 feet away, uh, there. And then Dan Mullen kind of runs towards that as well as he's kind of screaming at the officials at the same time. Some Missouri assistant coach says something to him, and he takes it from a nine to a ten, and just goes right after that coach, irate as he can be, having to be held back and stuff. Did he overreact in the head coaching position? Absolutely, he did. Did he overreact in general? Probably not. But as a head coach, you you, you can't do that. And I think the team. Now, don't get me wrong; the team is fed off of it. And talking to people throughout the whole week, the team loved it. Uh, it may be a point that we go back at some point of this season and say that right there, that moment right there. So we can point to that, 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 that Florida put it all together and hasn't looked back since Saturday will tell a whole lot more about that. But I mean, yeah. And then he shows up after the game dressed as Darth Vader and hey, look, that was planned anyway. I mean, come on. He didn't just decide when everything that happened that night that he was going to dress up as Darth Vader. You know, it just it happened to be Halloween. Exactly. It was Halloween. He's he's even, I remember going back and listening to him last year and he does this, 
uh, for his assistant coaches. And he lets his assistant coaches, no matter what day of the week it is or anything like that, take Halloween night off and spend with their family and stuff. So it's a, he was having fun and, and all that stuff. So the whole Darth Vader stuff, I know people, you know, he's the head coach and oh, you, you can't do that. You can't have fun in college football. Well, you know, Dan Mullen's cut from a different cloth there. So did he overreact? Yes. Um, I don't think he, I don't think he instigated a fight. It just kind of happened. It's not like he went out there and told his guys to go go out there and fight uh, at Missouri with everything that happened. But his actions didn't help, of course. But uh, that's why he got fined. And that's why a couple of Florida players are suspended for the Georgia first half of the Georgia game. And uh, we'll go from there. This is a near impossible question to ask somebody who, on one hand, covers the games, covers the teams. And when I say teams, I mean, obviously, it's Florida. But by extension, you know the SEC and you you know the personnel and follow the teams across college football. Uh, but on the other hand, you're a, you're a Florida fan. The reason you're doing this is because you're a Florida fan. So every coach is evaluated by his fan base, especially at an elite program based on wins and losses. The guy could be a total jerk. If he's winning conference championships, going to the playoff, then he's great. Mm-hmm. If he's not, then he's not. He could be the nicest guy in the world. Uh, but Outside of that, uh, do do Gator fans generally um, enjoy Dan Mullen, uh, defend his actions, believe that he's fine or okay with his persona? Yeah, right now, because he's winning games. He's winning 10 games a year. But if he doesn't win Saturday, Mark, I think a lot of this stuff from the last month probably gets expounded even more. The whole pack the swamp with COVID, you know, the COVID situation, the team catching, you know, then in turn catching COVID and being out for a couple of weeks. And then the incident last week versus Missouri, you got there and lose to Georgia Saturday. Then of course that all that stuff comes back around. You beat Georgia on Saturday and people were talking about your football team being uh, a college football playoff con- contender again. And all that other stuff kind of just goes by the wayside uh, a bit. So Gator fans in general like Dan Mullen. Uh, he's got a little spurrier in him with taking shots at opponents and you know, bringing the offense uh, along with it and, and scoring points. Uh, and you know, just really also out. He doesn't he doesn't give a crap what anybody else thinks. Dan Mullen's going to be Dan Mullen, and I think we've quickly learned that from a media side and, and a fan side that Dan Mullen's going to be Dan Mullen, and uh, you either like him or you don't. So he's he's not going to cater to uh, to anybody or, or go be friends with anybody, and probably likes it that way. So uh, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Uh, of course, winning games is really all that matters. You can get away with a whole lot uh, as long as you're winning ball games, kind of like you said there. So, but yeah, so, you know, Saturday goes a long way in I think Gator fans' mind of Dan Mullen uh, in the future of the program and you know, the nation thinking the same thing. I have a very clear picture in my mind of these two teams and what they bring to the table. So I'm not confused about that, trying to figure out strengths and weaknesses and what worked well and what hasn't. I'm just trying to figure out when I make a prediction on this game, and I have no idea at this point what's going to win out. Is it going to be Florida's offense, throwing the ball all over the field, the best quarterback in the conference, all of that coming together because – I used to rely on defense. He used to lean on mm-hmm. defense. And like Nick Saban said a few days ago, hey, the game swayed the offensive way, and offense typically wins out. Um, Georgia, for as good as they are defensively, are missing four or five players uh, on that side of the ball. And I thought both safeties, but our, our 247 sports guy says uh, just LeCount will be uh, out for the game. But still, just a lot of talent missing. Jordan Davis is an exceptional run stuffer on that side of the uh, and and pushes the pocket. He's going to be gone. So trying to weigh out, okay, is it still going to come down despite these Georgia personnel losses to the same fourth quarter that I watched the last two years where Georgia talent up and down the roster and just sheer muscle on both sides of the line of scrimmage in the trenches is going to push them around and hold them to 30 yards rushing. Meanwhile, Zamir White's going to be starting to break off seven and 10 and 12 yard runs in the fourth quarter, or because of the way we play football these days is, is, is Florida going to score even against a really good defense, 31, 35 points. And there's no way Georgia's going to score that against almost anybody. Right. Uh, Mark, you go to that point, you admit 30 points is probably that benchmark. You, you, you're going out there and saying, if Florida puts up 30 or more points, they're winning this game. If they go out there and score less than thirty, then the game's in question. You, you, you know, you're, you're going to see you will you'll see who comes out uh, in, in the end with that. Mark, a couple of things. 
last couple of years, uh, defense in this game has won out. Um, not a big surprise a couple of years ago in, in, in 2018, Dan Mullen's first year. Georgia's a much better team, uh, of course, just coming off of a national championship appearance. Still a really good team. Florida fought tooth and nail. You know, the game was controlled by Georgia, but Florida found a way to, to keep that game close at times. Uh, last year, not really a, a surprise that Georgia wins, but the Florida offense was coming in humming that game. Had really played well against LSU. Georgia came in struggling versus with a loss versus South Carolina and a struggle against Kentucky. You go to that game, a lot of people were picking Florida in that game, but but once again, defense won out in that game. Martin, in those two games, Dan Mullen didn't produce over 300 yards on Kirby Smart. He's struggled versus Kirby Smart. So that's another thing to keep going back to is, you know, for all the good Dan Mullen has done on the offensive side of the ball, Kirby Smart, whether it be a defensive coordinator at Alabama going against Mullen at Mississippi State, He's controlled him, and he's controlled him the first two years as uh, the the head coaches of Florida and Georgia. So something's going to have to give. Something's going to have to change Dan Mullen's way uh, of scoring points and getting yards uh, on Kirby Smart. And maybe it takes some defensive players coming out. Maybe it takes a quarterback that's setting SEC records and, and, and Florida records right now uh, to, to, to make that difference. And we all go back and look at that Georgia-Alabama game just a few weeks ago and what Alabama was able to do. Uh, versus versus this Georgia defense and Florida can do a lot of the same things, but they they attack different. Florida doesn't attack downfield like Alabama does. Is it that type of offense that's going to have to score points on Georgia, or is Kyle Pitts and Kadarius Tony can they do something similar? But it's not the same. They don't they don't beat DBs deep. They, 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 they Florida's offense just drives down the field. There are explosive plays, but they create their own explosive plays through catching runs and, and not not a whole lot of getting behind the DB. So to Florida see something in, in, in film where they can get guys that can do that as well, or is it a lot of what we've seen where they just kind of put together three, four minute drives and just go down the field and, and, and score. So, and can you do that against a Georgia defense? And then the Mark, the last point I'll make is Florida's got to run the ball better. You, you mentioned that Florida around 20 yards rushing last year. That, that counts sacks as well, but you know, I, Georgia's missing some players up front. Florida's still in Mark, the, the 14 years in a row. The team that's run the ball more has won this game. That's that's only a trend for this year. That doesn't really mean much this year. Florida's not going to outrush Georgia. Still doesn't mean they can't win the game. So, Georgia, it, to me, it's all about situational running for Florida. Can you go pick up a third and two when you need to go pick up a third and two? Third and goal, fourth and goal, and you need a score. Can you go out there and run the ball for that for that score? It's going to have to be situational running for Florida. They may have a little more success because of who's missing for Georgia. But Georgia, Florida's not going to go out there and, and outrush Georgia. If they do, for sure they're going to win the game. But nobody's predicting that. Nobody really sees that happening. If the game plays out like we think it does, Florida's going to pass the ball, and Florida's going to have to go, score, go out there and score high 20s at 30s, and you take your chances to see if you can win the game that way. Uh, people like, comment, share the video on social media, subscribe right here. We talk college football the, all the time. There's no reason why you shouldn't. All right, Gators Breakdown, join Dave over there. Uh, one, one last question from Across Enemy Lines. Looking at this Georgia quarterback situation, I gave Kirby Smart the benefit of the doubt, even off the Jake Fromm, Jace, Justin Fields situation, that you know he knows his football team. He's at practice. We're not. He selects the guy, especially considering – the reliance is not on the quarterback in this system, especially with the defense and the running game, like it would be somewhere else. Like you need the dynamic guy. So Stetson Bennett's not going to turn it over. And he turned in a good three games, two and a half games against the likes of Tennessee, Auburn and Arkansas in the second half. But he's obviously not good enough. I was looking at that Kentucky game thinking, you know, here we are Thursday night. Uh, I think they these two teams could still be playing and Georgia would still be holding them to three points. This was the game to experiment. This was the game to either experiment with Stetson Bennett, get him reps, throw him 30, 32 passes, not 13, or you bring in Dewan Mathis. And I don't know what the deal is with Carson Beck and JT Daniels, what's going on there. And you audition maybe for the mm -hmm. game, but they just went with the survive and advance mode of 14 to three, throw it 12 times and move on to the next game. And that's the worrisome part for Flores, because I said, you go back and look at last year's Georgia Kentucky game. Now they had a bye week in between, but it looked very similar. Now that game was in a pouring down rain or whatever, but it was still very low scoring, knockdown, drag out type of game. And Florida's offense is humming, but 
come Jacksonville, Georgia finds a way to score more points than Florida. So, you know, hopefully it's just not falling into the same trap of kind of what happened last year, and it just turns around and happens again this year. But, Mark, I, I put the tweet out today. It, it's so weird. You go back to signing day 2018, Florida signing Emory Jones, Georgia signing Justin Fields. Neither one are going to be on the field starting for their teams. Emory Jones still at Florida. But if you were to ask anybody that signing day in 2018, who the starting quarterbacks are going to be for both teams, they're probably picking Emory Jones and Justin Fields. Instead, we're getting Kyle Trask and Stetson Bennett. <laughs> so you, it, the, college football is so weird sometimes, and, and, and that's one aspect that it's very weird when you look at the quarterback situation for both teams uh, right now. Kyle Trask was not a highly recruited guy. We, we all know the story. He started for the University of Florida. Stetson Bennett's a walk-on from my hometown of Blackshear, Pierce, Blackshear Georgia, Pierce County. I, I followed him. I know his career very well. Another reason I need Florida to win this game, I can't go back to Blackshear getting beat by Stetson Bennett out there. So we'll, we'll see where everything goes with, with, with that one. But, look, he's got to play better. I mean, right now, uh, he, he does have to go out there and light the world on fire. Georgia's going to have to run the ball to help him, help him set up some play-action passes to slow down uh, a pass rush that, look, you don't have to get close to him. Teams have proven that. All you do is get close enough, put your hands up, and you're going to bat some balls away, and it's going to it's going to stop some stop some of uh, some of the pass plays for, from Stetson Bennett. So Georgia's going to have to hit them, have to hit some uh, big runs. Probably use the running backs out of the backfield as well. Take their chances. Uh, you know, throwing some deep balls every now and then, and and, and but you know. Stetson Bennett is going to have to make a play. There's going to be a third and seven. There's going to be a third and six where the the, the plays in his, on his shoulders, and he's got to go out there and make a throw. And as you said, they started out the season doing pretty good that last couple of games. Teams probably started getting more film on him, started seeing what he likes to do, what side the field he likes to throw on, what kind of coverage he likes to throw on, and teams have adjusted. And you know, if you you can, if you want to play man, that's probably the most dangerous part. Because Georgia's got athletes, and sometimes they can just out athlete you, and he'll find that guy. But if you go out there and play zone a bit, mix up your coverages, show him some blitz packages, and make him make a throw in a window, he struggles in, in, in that regard. So we'll see what what Todd Gretzen comes up with. He's struggled in this game the last couple of years. Hasn't been able to get to the Georgia quarterback. Only one sack in the last two games versus Georgia for a team that's been able to get to the quarterback uh, for the most part, but not be able to do it versus Georgia. We'll see if they can crank it up Saturday. Georgia, Florida should be fascinating. David Waters, Gators Breakdown. Please check him out on your favorite audio platform or right here on YouTube. David, we appreciate you stopping by. Always love the insight. Thanks, Mark.